I would like to talk about the second coming of the Lord. We understand that uh, this doctrine of uh, the coming of, of the Lord, of the advent of Jesus, is a very important one in the Bible. The church should understand that today we need to share a little bit more with people attending church about the coming of the Lord, the second coming of the Lord. We also understand that there are different views about uh, this uh, very important uh, event. It will take place in the future, of course, but many people or different churches have uh, various views about the second coming of the Lord. The one that was prevalent in the past was what we call the post-tribulational coming. The second coming of the Lord will take place only after the great tribulation. Back then, almost every church member believed that Jesus would come after the great tribulation. Later on, in the 19th century, there came up a group called the Plymouth Brethren. Among the leaders of this group, we found Benjamin Wills Newton, John Nelson Darby, and they were trying to understand the manner of which the coming of the Lord will take place. Before G.N. Darby, there was Edward Irving who studied in depth the events related to the second coming of the Lord. They came to, uh, at the very beginning, Darby himself believed that the church would see the great tribulation. But in the process of studying the Bible or trying to understand the second coming of the Lord, Darby came up with a new teaching about the coming of the Lord. He was influenced by the writings of Edward Irving. What was on Darby's newly found doctrine? He believed that the Lord will come uh, in two phases. There will be a silent coming of the Lord, then the church will be raptured and, and will go to heaven to spend seven years with the Lord in heaven. That is the teaching of Darby. It was back then a new doctrine. Even Darby switched from the view that the great tribulation will take place before the coming of the Lord. Now he, he, he came to believe that there will be a silent coming of the Lord and the church will be raptured after seven years in heaven Jesus will come back with his church on earth to rule over the world for 1,000 years. Those teachings came to be very familiar within the evangelical churches. A famous Bible commentator named Cyrus Schofield would later promote Darby's teachings which encompass the seven dispensations between the, the sixth and the seventh dispensation, the church and the kingdom, all those events regarding the new doctrine will take place. And Darby started to teach these, uh, these doctrines in 1831. Darby traveled abroad to propagate his doctrine. He was helped later on at the end of the 19th century, at the beginning of the 20th century, by the work of Cyrus Caulfield. He published books and commentaries in the Bible and many seminaries, many Bible schools adopted the teaching of Darby.
commonly known as dispensationalism. But there is a problem here with the teaching of Darby. There are things, when you consider them, they contradict the very teaching of the Bible. How do people who agree with Darby's teachings react when there is a contradiction between the teaching of the Word of God and what Darby is teaching? The commentators would come up with a new interpretation for which there are no Bible verses. For instance, the Bible mentions what we call the first resurrection, and since they believe the first resurrection will take place at the coming of the Lord, and many people believe that some other believers would be saved during the Great Tribulation, they came up with what we call multiple phases of the first resurrection, so things that are not found in scriptures. I should say that the problems at the very beginning uh, Darby had with even Benjamin Wills, George Muller, the men who founded an orphanage by faith. Uh, George Muller was a man of faith, and some other ministers of the word, they found it to be not well grounded in scriptures because they, you will not find any verse that can show you Jesus will come back silently. Uh, Darby couldn't prove it. And there are many other issues with Darby's teaching. The, the word of the Lord in Matthew 24, when he said, They will gather together his chosen ones. According to Darby, the chosen ones are the Jews. Pastor Benjamin Wills, Dr. Trigels, George Muller would not agree with that. Then there was a split not only regarding the discipline between the Plymouth brethren, but uh, mainly about the teaching regarding the second coming of the Lord. Many church members and ministers tend to disregard this very important topic. They think that any dissenting opinion regarding the current view about the coming of the Lord shouldn't be taken into consideration. Since we believe what we believe, we don't want to hear anything else. The Bible is urging us to consider the coming of the Lord, study scriptures, stick to the revealed words, do not uh, come up with private interpretation, uh, stick to the word, keep the word, and if the Bible doesn't say something, do not make up for it with commentaries. When we do that, we are in trouble. And it's also is a very important doctrine. People should dwell on those things because this is the hope of the church. We have to read the Bible and believe, not, not come up with our way of thinking. We have to receive the word, receive the word of God, keep it simple, and say what the Bible says. That way we are blessed. But it shouldn't be considered to be something useless to examine the manner of which the second coming of the Lord will take place. Let's consider uh, some verses in the Bible regarding that very important doctrine. The first problem with Darby's doctrine was this one. In his view, there will be a silent coming of the Lord, which can take place anytime, tonight, tomorrow morning, next week. Next month, next year, the church will be then raptured. That is another word. The rapture will take place silently. And people will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And in his view, from there, they will go to heaven. Although the text would rather suggest that Jesus is coming, the church will be gathered around Jesus coming on earth. Uh, because uh, even the Greek expression implies somebody coming, and the word used in the Greek uh, text is parousia, and at the parousia, that means when Jesus is coming here on earth, 
he will stop midway somehow and the heavenly places and the church will uh, will meet him over there in order to come back with him that is the idea uh, and then but for Darby the rapture will bring us back to Jesus will take us back to heaven he will go back himself to heaven coming down and go back to heaven with the church to spend seven years in, uh, in heaven with the Father at the end of the seven year period he will come back all of these are not well grounded in scriptures we don't have any verse in the Bible that will say clearly that the church is going to spend seven years in heaven with the Lord they imply that the church will uh, spend seven years with the Lord because they said the church will be spared uh, during the uh, great tribulation as a result they imagine that the church is going to go to heaven and spend seven years and and uh, with the Lord there are no verses for uh, such teachings but let's understand it better by reading the Bible the first problem is the silent coming of, of the Lord we don't have any verse for that he will come as a thief in the night that that expression means that the world will be taken by surprise the coming of the Lord will come as a surprise but is not going to be a silent one rather we got verses like in Revelation 1 verse 7 we can read very well behold he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Every eye shall see him. There are no other texts implying that Jesus will not be seen at his coming. People may say, oh, it's going to be the second coming. But this is what we got in the Bible. Only if we would have seen a verse saying that Jesus will not be seen, that would have been a good way for everybody to be convinced that there will be a silent coming of the Lord. Wherever you go in the Bible, the same expression is there. The coming of the Lord will be seen by all. Even more in Matthew 24. If therefore they tell you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, don't go out. Behold, he is in the inner wombs, don't believe it. For as the lightning flashes from the east and is seen even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man. For wherever the carcass is, there is where the vultures gather together. That is the way. The, the, Lord, the church is going to gather around the, the Lord. But the, verse, the next verse, verse 29, is very enlightening. But immediately after the tribulation of those days. Look at the word tribulation of those days. The sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its, its light. The stars will fall from the sky. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. They will see the Son of Man. Verse 31, He will send out his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his chosen ones from the four winds, from one hand of the sky to the other. Darby claimed that the chosen ones are the Jews, the children of Israel. But remember there is a principle in hermeneutics you have to consider the overall context of scriptures before you say something. Chosen ones can, can be Jews, can be Christians, but when you have to say specifically you are dealing with Jews, you need to back up your text with another text. You see what I'm saying? 
you cannot say we are dealing uh, the chosen ones are Jews. It's uh, it's a private interpretation. You cannot say it like that because we know that there are two groups of uh, people on earth that claim to be the chosen ones, the Jews and the Christians. Now, uh, the choice would be for the Christians because Jesus is talking to his disciples, to the church here. It's a, it's a message for the church, not for Israel. And we will see that Benjamin Wills Newton, a leader of the Plymouth Brethren Movement, was not really happy with that interpretation, was right. Why? Because the Bible explains elsewhere that what will happen to the Jews at the coming of the Lord. The Bible doesn't say they will gather together uh, the Jews uh, from the four winds from one hand of the sky to, to the other. Therefore, that interpretation doesn't stand here. Why? Because in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, the Bible said, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they are pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. What the Bible is implying here, is saying here, at the time of the coming of the Lord, the Jews will be right there in their location in Jerusalem. That will be the time when they will get saved uh, as a proof of the repentance of their conversion. They will cry. There will be a time of mourning because they crucified the Lord. They denied their master. They did not receive him. But now at the time of the coming of the Lord, they will not be gathered together. The Lord will come down and as a result, they will see him and they will start crying, mourning, as we see here in the Bible. Therefore, the chosen ones is talking about in Matthew 24 that will gather together from the four winds, from one hand of the sky to the other, are church members. They will be with the Lord after the tribulation of these days, after the great tribulation. Let's understand it better and, uh, uh, because the idea of uh, Darby is that the church uh, would not see the great tribulation. It's amazing. Why they will say that? Because the very verse even the word klepsis in the Bible means tribulation, and Matthew, in fact, use it in Matthew 24 and explain what kind of tribulation that will be. And he called it's only after the tribulation of these days that the Lord will come. But here, the verse in, found in Revelation chapter 7 confirms we are dealing with the church. The church will see that period. And the Bible said, after this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms and their hands. People from, you know, all nations. The church here. That is, he's talking about the church. Because uh, we got, as I said earlier, you got two groups of chosen ones in the Bible, the Jews and the church. Here, when he's talking about with people which no man could number, of all nations, kindreds and people and tongues, he's talking about the church. And the Bible said, these are the which come out of great tribulation and have washed the robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They saw it. They came out of it. They suffered it. That is what the Bible is saying. A group coming from people coming from different nations, church, the church of the Lord. We see that period. 
And yet they use the text to say, no, the church is not going to see it because uh, the Great Tribulation, uh, the people will say, oh, the Bible is talking about the uh, people who will be there at the time of the Great Tribulation. You cannot uh, escape scriptures. You cannot uh, come up with your private interpretation of the Bible. He's saying people and tongues and people of all nations. It's the church. The church is going to see it. But if you have any doubt, uh, the problem here with uh, the doctrine of Darby, it's the left behind theory. And, and the left behind theory of Darby, uh, we got two groups, two main groups. There are many subgroups, but here we can say about the two big groups. According to some, those who are not ready from the church will see the great tribulation. That is the teaching uh, of uh, Darby. And they will be, according to that doctrine, the wicked ones, the people who are not serving God, uh, they will suffer the pain of the great tribulation along with the remnants of the church, church members who are not ready for the coming of the Lord. But uh, that is the same problem again when you are dealing with this text. The overall context of scriptures of the Bible shows that it's not true. Uh, when Jesus comes, it will be a final coming. He will reward the faithful and judge the unfaithful. It's not going to be like Jesus comes and people will be left to suffer the great tribulation. It's, it cannot be clearer than that because that's what it's very important to avoid man-made comments and use them instead of... Uh, the inspired word of God. We have to look at scriptures and understand what the Bible is saying and remove man-made doctrines, remove the, the doctrines of Darby's as Muller said, my brother, I'm a constant reader of my Bible and I soon found that what I was taught to believe by Darby's doctrine did not always agree with what my Bible said, I came to see that I must either part company with John Darby or my precious Bible, and I chose to cling to my Bible and part from Mr. Darby. Uh, then that is what he said. He wanted to follow scriptures, the well-known left behind doctrine is not grounded in scriptures what the bible is saying at the coming of the lord the judgment will start that means god will set uh, the record straight there will be no more great tribulation after the coming of the lord let's see what the bible is saying in second thessalonians chapter one which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of god that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When, look at the word, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Not the word, everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Look at the word here. Look at the statement here. How clear that can be. The Lord will come to, verse 9, who shall be punished with everlasting destructions from the presence of the Lord. 
and from the glory of his power. There is no time for the wicked to stay for the great tribulation to persecute the church anymore because the Bible said everlasting destruction will take place for the wicked at the coming of the Lord. Look at what the Bible said in verse 10, when he shall come to be glorified in his sins. That is the thing. He's coming to be glorified in his sins, but the very day that he will be glorified in his sins, he will judge the wicked. Malachi chapter 4 says, says the same thing. The Lord will come to punish those who don't believe and reward those who believe. He will do the same thing the very same day. He's not going to rapture them according to the Bible. So they spend seven years in heaven and people who are left behind, uh, the uh, church members who are, who are not ready and the uh, uh, wicked will be left behind. No. The very day is going to reward the faithful. The Bible said he will destroy uh, the uh, unfaithful. That is very clear. This text destroys what we call the left behind theory. Nothing will be left after the coming of the Lord. The second coming of the Lord will change the world as we know it. And you see it also when you look at uh, Matthew chapter 24. Look at what will happen. And, and one will understand is, is going to be final. But shortly after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. And the powers of the heavens will be shaken. You see that? The stars will fall, fall from the sky. Some people don't understand it. They say, oh, the stars are big. Who is the master of everything? The Lord is in charge. By the power of the glory of God, he will be uh, the burn, they will be they will burn down at the time they reach or whatever the place they reach, falling from that place, they will burn. It's it's a big commotion. As we read in Second Peter chapter three, verse ten, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The universe as we know it will be shaken. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful thing. It's not, uh, they may be as big a star, may be as, maybe uh, we know that the sun is a star itself. Maybe there are, certainly there are stars that may be bigger than the sun. They will disintegrate. But the Bible said they will fall from the sky. That falling doesn't mean they are going to come here, to end up on earth, but it's explaining the commotion that will take place by the power of the coming of the Lord. But one thing we should notice, it's not possible when we see the stars falling and the powers of heaven shaken and the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light and to, for things to come back and, and a great tribulation after that to take place. And the Bible is confirming the, this fact by showing us the very day Jesus uh, uh, comes to reward the saved, he will deal with the wicked. We know that the world will be different after the coming of the Lord. The light of the sun will be seven times brighter and the light of the moon will be like the light of the sun as we know it now. And the Bible said at the end of the 1,000 years, uh, the devil who was imprisoned will be released and a war will ensue, Gog and Magog. And after the war, there will be the final judgment. The second resurrection will then take place. That will be the resurrection of the wicked. Let's go into another text on a clear one. And no one should uh, think that they can argue with uh, the Bible, with scriptures, because it's clear. But the problem is, when we got uh, years of comments built up into our mind, you don't see scriptures anymore. We see our minds. And it's one needs to fight against uh whatever a misconception we may have 
uh, you know, kept in our mind for many years to come to scriptures and repeat exactly what the Bible is saying. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is one of those texts, and when you read it, when you see it, you, and when you hear somebody believing the doctrine that they will not be, uh, the church will not see the great tribulation, we will not see the Antichrist, because the great tribulation is the time when the Antichrist will appear. Uh, when I say great tribulation, we say the rule of the Antichrist is going to be the same thing. And in fact, that the presence of the Antichrist, of the devil on earth, will bring the great tribulation. But here, this text is it's clear. And I wonder when I read it, I read that this text and somebody will not still say that the church will not see the, will not see the great tribulation. I ask myself, are we reading the same Bible? Do we have the same Bible? Maybe that is a reason more to love the Word of God because we are reading the same thing, but there are things that can be so clear, so simple to believe, yet people do not want to believe, to receive what they are reading, what, what is just before them. They want to argue, they want to come up with their own interpretation, but it's clear. What else one can say after reading 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 regarding the great tribulation, the coming of the Antichrist, how the church will see those days, the church will suffer those things. We have read before in Revelation chapter 7 that uh, the nations, people, the, those who wash their uh, garments and the blood of the Lamb will see it. But here it's clear and one cannot argue when we read now we beseech you brethren by the coming of our lord jesus christ and by our gathering together unto him that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as for us, as that the day of christ is at hand let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that men of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who poseth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that is God. That is wonderful. The Bible, that day, verse 3, that day, for that day shall not come. Do not allow somebody to tell you that the Lord, the coming of the Lord can take place now. That day shall not come. The coming of the Lord will not come. And Paul is writing to the Thessalonians to explain to them, uh, oh, you shouldn't be soon shaken in, in your mind or trouble, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letters, as for most, to say that the day of Jesus the, the coming of the Lord is imminent. It can take place tonight. It can take place tomorrow. It can take place next year. No, he is saying there are things you should see first. He is giving them things they should look at, they should consider, and before believing that the Lord is coming. It's not going to take place like that. It's not going to be a surprise for you because and is is giving them a second warning let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first that means before the coming of the lord we should see the falling away we may see we are on our way to the falling away there are still faithful church members faithful churches but you see we see what is happening now in the world people are uh, changing the gospel they are changing it the falling away is the, right, is coming but they are still faithful servants of the lord and that men of sin be revealed that men of sin be revealed is another teaching of the word that means the antichrist should come first the son of perdition and those two things the falling away 
and the revelation of the man of sin, of the Antichrist, called uh, elsewhere the beast, the wicked. And there are so many names for the Antichrist in the Bible, but we understand that that is the first thing we should look at uh, before we will know that Jesus is coming. The falling away and the revelation of the man of sin. That is clearly expressed here. He's going to go uh, and sit in the temple of God and he will claim that he is God. I think those verses are pretty clear and uh, one should understand that uh, we cannot play with those things. We have to keep scriptures. Repeat what the Bible is saying. If we do it like, like that, there will be no problem, no troubles, nothing that will be a source of problems for the children of God. As the Bible said, those things will take place and the church will be there. And if we have a little doubt, Revelation 20, verse, uh, starting at verse 4, explains it very well. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their ha hands. They live and reign with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. The first resurrection is the resurrection of the righteous that will take place in First Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, for, as I told you, Jesus is coming in the air, the church will meet him, and he will come down with his church on earth. And the Bible is claiming that because the first resurrection will take place then, uh, at the, uh, uh, then when Jesus comes. We see in the book of Revelation also that the Bible said the kingdom at the, the seventh trumpet will sound, and the kingdom of the world will be the kingdom of the Lord. He's going to take power over the world. He will rule over the world for 1,000 years. That is what we call the millennium. But that same seven trumpets is the last trumpet in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52. In a moment, and the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible and we shall be changed then we have all those things in the bible when we compare them when we study them we can conclude that the teaching of darby is not accurate i don't mean if somebody believes in that teaching he will not be saved but one needs to stick to scriptures as muller pastor benjamin wills Dr. Trigels and so many people did in the past. They stood up to Darby and said, what you are teaching is not biblical. We cannot receive that. Unfortunately, the churches and the seminaries kept only the teaching of Darby instead of teaching the church the very word of God regarding uh, the ministers, the pastors who are going to preach the gospel to explain to them there was a conflict. It was not the belief of Darby. Darby at the very beginning believed that the church will, will see the great uh, tribulation. He changed it. And he came up with two comings of the Lord. They should have explained those things to people who are going to serve. So they may have a view, an open view of the teachings because Dr. Wills, Darby, Dr. Triggers with books about the second coming of the Lord. The conflict between uh, the Plymouth Brethren after Darby came up with the new doctrine regarding the coming of the Lord should have been taught to future pastors, future ministers. I know that uh, they are informed about the doctrine of Darby, but little they know about the conflict that took place between Dr. Tregels, Pastor Benjamin Wills and George Muller and some other ministers. The details thereof are not taught if uh, that would have been the case, a more balanced view of the coming of the Lord would have been a blessing for the church because people take those things, churches, 
ministers take those things as biblical teachings. They don't see the mechanism uh, that, that brought Darby to his conclusion. That should have been studied. And the historical record regarding the well-founded objections of men of God, like M George Muller, Pastor Benjamin Wills, Dr. Triggers, and the big conflict that took place then should have been part of the curriculum of every uh, seminary or Bible school. So an understanding of the doctrine of the coming of the Lord would have been a blessing for the church at large. But the way it is present presented, it is like this is the Bible teaching and they are saying things you don't see any verses for a silent coming of the Lord, any verses for seven years in heaven, any verses for uh, the left behind theory, nothing like that, just comments after comments, comments after comments. And when there is a problem, like some people will say, there is a second phase of the first resurrection, there is a third phase of the first resurrections. I've, I've, I've read comments saying, oh, the first resurrection started at the very beginning because they try to address these things to their view instead of accepting the clear teaching of the Word of God, which says clearly that the first resurrection will take place at the Pausia.